2 Corinthians 1, the Apostle Paul says in verse 23, I call God as my witness, and I stake my life on it, that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, because it is by faith you stand firm. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad but you whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. The word of the Lord. Next week is an important milestone in the life of our church. You should have a card on your seat. Um, we, I hope that all of you and your friends and family are able to make it, to be here with us. Uh, it marks the 25th anniversary of Oak Point Church. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's an incredible thing. And we'll be doing a pastoral handoff from Pastor Bob to me. We'll also have at 4 p.m. next Sunday, our Ezra 8 night of prayer. It will, be a, it will be a day of prayer and fasting. Now you may ask, will we have donuts on January 30th? No, we will not. Because it's a day of fasting and prayer. But they're coming, okay? Just hang tight. Now, you may also ask, well, what do we do during the Ezra 8 night of prayer? Great question. We sing. Songs break up the prayer segments. We sit in pods so that you can sit with friends and family and pray together. We move about so you're not locked into your seat. We're guided in prayer. Beth Swiss, our prayer coordinator, puts great thought and planning into the gathering. So if you're just learning to pray, maybe you're here like, I'm just learning what prayer is all about. This is the perfect event for you. So come and stay as long as you like, but come to Ezra 8. Two weeks ago, my wife and I were having dinner at the Hobbs with the rest of the elders and our wives, and we had a wonderful time. Anytime Tammy Hobbs cooks, it's going to be a wonderful time. But it was also the first time that we got to be together as elders with our wives, and we were able to pray for one another. And as we were asking for prayer requests, Chris Crick uh, said that she had been reading the book of Acts, and that one thing that she kept seeing again and again in Acts is that the followers of Jesus got together and prayed. They got together and prayed, and that's what we did that night, and that's what we're going to be doing for our Ezra 8 night of prayer, and I can't think of a better way for us to start our next chapter as a church, our next quarter century for Oak Point Church. If praying together remains always at the center of who we are, we need to hold on to our hats because God's going to blow us away. We continue our series in 2 Corinthians entitled, Together We Will Not Be Shaken. And this letter is so helpful to us in this time of transition. Because actually, this is the letter where Paul is probably the most self-conscious about the dynamic between congregation and apostolic leadership team. Today, Paul's going to help us answer a question that all of us need help with post-pandemic. How do you repair a strained relationship? How do you heal a strained relationship? Do you do nothing? Do you just let it wither and die? Do you keep insisting on your way of seeing things? Do you pray? Well, of course, you always pray, but there's a lot more that we can do. In the God-ordained humbling task of parenting, some destructive dynamics can set in between parent and child. Say that you have a defiant child so that every time you address them, they have a ready no. Why? You always. You know, that defiant posture deeply affects the parent. The parent may begin to uh, dread any encounter with the child, resent the child, avoid the child, attack the child. And because parenting is a long game, that defiant dynamic can become the dominant tone in the parent-child relationship, much like gray is the dominant color of winter days in Michigan, much to our chagrin. Now let's ask some questions. Let's call this child Luke, 
Okay, And so when mom was pregnant with Luke, mom and dad announced that they were expecting a baby boy and all their friends cheered them on and signed up for a gift from the registry, even for that Star Wars baby onesie that says, Luke, I am your father. But here's the question. Were Luke's parents dreaming of the time when their baby boy would become a teenager and their main form of interaction with one another would be confrontation, defiance and confrontation. Were they dreaming of that? No, they were not. They were dreaming of sharing their love with their child. And yet here they are. Or think of your relationships at work. Have you ever worked with a difficult coworker so that you found it easier to, to gossip about her, to avoid her, to interpret all her behavior only and always negatively? Or think of the media's relationship to politicians. Instead of the focus being on the good of the American people, the nonstop focus seems to be on criticism for their incompetence. See, in my experience, Destructive dynamics and interpersonal relationships are extremely difficult to overcome. Paul was keenly aware of the strain in his relationship with the church in Corinth. He wanted that relationship to be one of joy, but he also knew that their history was making that relationship extremely painful and trust was vanishing. So how do you repair? How do you heal a strained relationship? We need to check ourselves. You need to check yourself and ask three questions. And the first one is, do you truly desire good for them? Do you truly desire good for them? Now, remember what we said last week. The Christians in Corinth were doubting Paul's motives, message, integrity, mission. Many of them found him unimpressive. They took, took offense that he did not charge him for the gospel. Some of them had a hard time trusting his motives for that. They did not like how he confronted the immorality in the church. And they had issue with the fact that he changed his travel plans a few times. They thought he was fickle, worldly, that he made expedient rather than principled decisions. Now, Paul, for his part, tried to direct their gaze at the yes of God in Jesus Christ in the hopes of reframing their perspective. What he's saying is, let God's eternal, irrevocable, invincible yes to you in Christ keep you from getting bent out of shape over smaller things. And then he gives them the real reason he changed his travel plans. It's not because he was fickle or worldly. It's because he did not. He wanted to spare them. He wanted to spare them. Look at verse 23. He says, I call God as my witness. And I stake my life on it, that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. The second visit from Paul to Corinth did not go well. He came there. It was an emergency visit from a report that he got from Timothy that things were not going well in Corinth. Now, what exactly happened during that visit, we're only able to put together from inferences in this letter. Paul went to them and he confronted them on their behavior and the result was pain. Pain to the church and pain to Paul. So he writes in chapter 2, verse 1, So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. The implication being that that second visit was painful. While he was with them in that visit, it seems he made plans with them that once he left, he was going to come back to them twice. Once on his way to Macedonia and once on his way back from Macedonia. By the way, Corinth was in southern Greece and Macedonia in northern Greece. Well, because of how poorly that second visit had gone, instead of going back to visit them, Paul changed his plan and instead he wrote them a letter, a letter we no longer have, a letter that some have called the severe letter or the tearful letter. This letter, he hoped, would do some hard surgery on the Corinthians and allow him to come back to them a third time with a different tone. So all of this helps us understand what Paul says in verse 23. I call God as my witness and I stake my life on it that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. The fire Paul was under must have been quite strong for him to say, I call God as my witness. I'm staking my life on it. You don't say, you don't do that lightly. And then he says, it was in order to spare you, to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. What Paul is saying is, my trip to you would be far more productive and pleasant 
If our relationship is on stronger grounds, it would make no sense for me to come back to you again and have more of the same. But Paul had to make sure that he wanted what was best for the Corinthians. In the aftermath of COVID, not that COVID is over, but in the aftermath of the last two years, I believe that the health of the most important relationships to us requires that we check ourselves, that we check our motives. Right now, the level is high of mental and emotional and relational unhealth. People hurt each other and they start relating to one another from a foundation of hurt and distrust rather than from a foundation of trust and love. And so we need to be able to check ourselves and ask, do I really want what is best for them? Even if it's costly to me, even if it's hard for me, think about a relationship you have that may be at present. It may be strained. Are you relating to this person from a place of trust? From a place of wanting what is best for them? Or are you relating to them from a place of hurt? and distrust. So ask yourself, do I truly desire good for them? That's the first question. The second question, do you have a sober view of your relationships? Do you have a sober view of your relationships? Look at verse 24. Paul says, not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, because it is by faith you stand firm. So here Paul clarifies what he meant in the previous verse by spare you. He says, I did not return to Corinth in order to spare you. When Paul says that he wants to spare them, what he means is he does not want to inflict any more pain on them. He doesn't want to have to come back to Corinth, find them in the same place where they were, and have to correct their behavior, or worse, rebuke them for it. Now, we hear that kind of language and may think like, whoa, whoa, that sounds kind of strong, even controlling, Paul. And that's why he comes in verse 24 and clarifies. He says, no, we don't lord it over your faith. No, what we do is we co-partner with you. We labor with you for your joy. And I want to say three brief things about that. Christians have only one Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. Everyone else is just a servant. Just a servant. Christians stand by faith. By faith in that Lord, in Christ not by the eloquence of their teachers or the skill of their leaders that don't stand by their own self-discipline, their own righteousness, their years of service to God. We stand by faith. Our faith is our absolute trust in the goodness of God to us, in his yes to us in Christ. And that, that faith, that trust that unites us to him is that which makes us stand. Also, Christian work that is distinctly Christian must produce joy joy. Paul says we, we work with you for your joy. It must produce joy in us and in the people we're working with, the people we're helping. So these are the, the things that Paul is bringing out in this verse, but we must keep clear the distinction between standing by faith and working with others for their joy. Think of a young man who's early in a relationship with a woman that he really likes. He thinks she's the answer to his deepest longings. And so his birthday is coming up. And so he, he makes sure that she knows it. And the pressure is on. Man, he starts building it up in his mind. He's dropping hints of all the things that he would like to do. But the big day comes and he's disappointed. She did something thoughtful, but nothing was going to be enough. Why? Because instead of allowing her to partake of his special day and just enjoy that, no, he made her the keeper of the keys to his happiness. And no one can live up to that. See, your happiness is your responsibility. Others can come along and enhance that happiness, but they can't create it. And I think one of the reasons that we have such a hard time in our relationships is because we don't have a sober view of them. We overload them with expectations. I mean, helicopter parenting is a great example of this, right? You've heard the term, right? Helicopter parenting. Parents who say to their children and about their children, I need to protect them from everything. I need to keep the world from hurting them. So I'm going to put my children in a bubble. No wonder parents live with such anxiety today. 
Love relationships also can struggle here because one of the partners will see the other as their savior, the one who can fulfill their every desire and answer their every need. And no relationship, no partner, no spouse can live up to that. Leaders in the church and in the workplace can also view themselves incorrectly or be viewed incorrectly, believing that too much depends on them. And so Paul comes and says, you stand by faith. He's reminding them of his proper role in their lives. He says, the one who makes you stand is Christ. What about me and Silas and Timothy and Titus? We just work with you. We co-partner with you for your joy. But it's a limited role. It's a wonderful thing to be able to come alongside people and enhance their joy, enhance what God is doing in their lives. But it's a limited role. Christ is the one that makes us stand and that by faith. What's our role? We just come alongside for their joy. So ask yourself, do you have a sober view of your relationships or do you overload them with expectation? Now, this is also very freeing because if your life is not going well right now, just think about that. You feel like, oh, my life is not going well right now. The great, the freeing thing about this is that you can't blame anyone. You shouldn't blame anyone else because you stand by faith. So ask yourself that question. And finally, Third question, are you willing to bear the cost of coming together? Are you willing to bear the cost of coming together? A repairing of healing that relationship. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says, he's still talking about this trip that he changed his mind about. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad but you whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you, that you would all share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears. Not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. As a culture, we often lament how divided we are. Families are divided, churches are divided, government is divided. When a relationship is strained, it takes great humility and energy to, to repair that breach. But we quit on people. We stop showing up. We stop talking. We stop listening. We blast them on social media and then gather around people who think just like us. My wife and I had great breakthrough in our marriage uh, when we learned, and, we, and this is something that we have to keep learning, uh, when we learned to keep talking to each other even when we don't see eye to eye. See, earlier in the marriage, and I'm sure, I'm sure married people here relate to this, right? Earlier in the marriage, we had a dynamic that was unhelpful. We would stop talking. Right? We're not seeing eye to eye. We stop talking. And I'm not saying that there's not ever time for a break. For sure, for sure that happens. But, but there's also a lot to be gained when you stop talking. So, for example, one, one of the issues maybe was over donuts. Okay? And so one of us would say, well, I think that donuts are awesome. Yeah, but from what store? Well, from Krispy Kreme, of course. No, Dunkin's better. Oh, you're crazy. Oh, you heard me. And then one of us would start crying and the other fuming. And I wouldn't say which one did what. Now, now what we do generally is we keep talking. We keep talking to one another. So one will say, well, Duncan's better. And the other one is like, hmm, really? Tell me more. Why do you believe that? Mm-hmm. I'm listening. Mm. Now, I don't quite see it like that, but, but I respect it. Let's just keep talking. And we keep talking, but you guys know, right? If you've been married for more than two days, you know that it takes great patience, great patience to, to, to stay connected in conflict. Anne and I will say to each other, let's keep holding hands while we're in conflict. But sometimes it's barely a pinky. It's barely a pinky, but we're like, let's hold on because it's challenging. You see, Paul was willing to do some things to bring himself and the Corinthian church together, but it was costly to him. What are some of the things that he did? Well, he was willing to take a step back. He was willing to take a step back. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. He says, So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. When we're trying to convince someone of our point of view, we can think, I just need to double down and overwhelm them with evidence, emotion, noise, and I'll win the argument. 
Paul was willing to take a step back. He must have known that changing his travel plans was going to make the Corinthians doubt him and malign him and, and find fault with him. But he also knew that sometimes you have to take a step back so that you can gather yourself and pray and rethink your position and allow the Spirit of God room to prevail. Because the point is not to win arguments, but to win people. And so Paul says in verse 2, For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad but you whom I have grieved? What he's implying is, if I came back to you under the same circumstances as in my previous trip, as in my previous letter, the outcome again would be grief, pain. And that's not what he's after. So Paul took a step back. Listen, sometimes the way forward is a step back. Paul also was not afraid to confront. He was not afraid to confront them. After his painful visit, the one that did not go over well, Paul leaves, but then he doesn't just, oh well. No, he sends them a letter. He sends a letter, and that letter was challenging. And as we go along in 2 Corinthians, we're going to see the effect of the letter. But in essence, many of the Corinthians had trouble with the letter. This is why he has to write this one to defend himself, but also they repented based on the letter. And you and I know that it's much easier to ignore problems than it is to confront people on their behavior and judgment. Listen, airplanes have fallen from the sky because the crew saw that they were in trouble and they failed to confront the pilot. This has happened multiple times. Companies rather let a nasty employee Ruin the company culture than to confront him or her on their behavior. Paul knew that problems don't just go away and that sometimes people have to be confronted. But it was costly to him because, come on, let's be real. None of us likes to be confronted. Oh, you want to tell me how I'm now wonderful and perfect? Go ahead. Make my day, said no one ever. Paul was not afraid to confront. And finally... The other thing that Paul did was he was vulnerable. He was vulnerable. We've already seen this as he opened the letter and told us about that trial that brought him to the brink of death. But he doesn't change his tone all the way until the end. Look at what he says in verse 4. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. Do you see that kind of self-disclosure? That's difficult in any context, but so much more toward people who are doubting you and maligning you and cooling in their affection toward you. But Paul just comes out and he says, I was in great distress, probably from the trials and persecutions that he was facing in Ephesus after he left Corinth. And while that's happening, he gets these poor reports about the church in Corinth, which is why he says, I, I, I was in anguish of heart and with many tears. What Paul is saying to them is, this was my posture of heart toward you. Yes, I said some hard things, but I said them from a heart of anguish with many tears because I wanted to show you the depth of my love for you. I did not want to grieve you. I wanted to show you how much I love you. Because when you love someone, then you do what is difficult to see that relationship flourish. Paul loved this church. The easy thing to do, the fickle thing to do, the worldly thing to do would have been for him to just cut his losses and peace out. He had plenty of gospel work to do in other cities and churches, but so much hung in the balance. The triumph of the gospel over human relational struggle. Going all the way back to Genesis and throughout history. One man, one person slays another. Families can't get along and love each other. Nation fights against nation. Paul knows that the gospel is different. But he had to be willing to bear the cost. And against all odds, work for joy. Work toward joy. Because you see, our gospel work together must lead to joy. Our gospel work together must lead to joy. We began by talking about those destructive dynamics that move into our homes, our workplaces, our churches, our cultural spaces, and ruin everything that is good. Parents relate to defiant children confrontationally rather than from love. 
Workers bad mouth their difficult co-workers rather than building an atmosphere of excellence and gratitude. The media doesn't even try to help us understand good politics. It's all about pointing fingers. Paul knew that there was a, a, a destructive dynamic building in his relationship with the church in Corinth. The last two interactions they had in person and in letter had been marked by grief, pain, distress. And Paul says, that's not why I came into relationship with you. Look at what he says in chapter 2, verse 1. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. Verse 2, for if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad, but you whom I have grieved. Verse 3, I wrote as I did so that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. Do you see? Paul has the humility and confidence in God to say this dynamic has to stop. We cannot endure together if grief instead of joy defines our relationship. Where he wants to take this relationship is to joy. To joy. I mean, look again with me in verse 24. He says, not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy. Verse 2, for if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad, but you whom I have grieved. Verse 3, I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy. Church, our gospel work together must lead to joy, to joy. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, came as God's yes to us. He has the power to undo every no, every rejection that has made you sick. He has the power to undo every no you've said to God. That's what sin is. Sin entered the world the moment our first parents said no to God. And from then on, every single person has said no to God and made the entire human race sicker with every rejection of our Creator, of our Heavenly Father. Now you would expect that God would say no back to us in response. We said no to Him, fine. I say no to you, but God is not like us. And so his posture toward us is yes in Christ. All the promises of God are yes in Christ. And he gives us his spirit. He puts his spirit in our hearts, who is the power of God, the love of God, creating new life within us. And one of the qualities that the spirit of God grows in us is joy. Joy. The capacity to enjoy the new life of God as the deepest reality about us. The thing that is most true about us, even in the midst of a broken world. So maybe your child is defiant, but you know that Christ loves them. And that he replenishes your strength, your, your weakness as a parent. And so you're able to move toward your child with love and with gladness of heart. So maybe your coworker is challenging, but you know that you work for the King of Kings and that he's making all things new and that your coworker needs his yes in Christ as desperately as you do. So you're able to move toward him or her with compassion and gratitude. So maybe your experience with the church has been marked by grief, pain, distress, but you trust that Jesus can turn graves into gardens and mourning to dancing and shame into glory. You know that he gives beauty for ashes. You see, when Jesus and his spirit are the deepest realities about you, then you can work from joy and for joy. You can work from joy and you can work for joy in others, even against all odds. If we had a joyometer, a device by which we measured our joy as Christians, our engagement with God, our hope for the future, our relationships with one another, our willingness to do, to sacrifice and do hard things for our kings, how high would you rate? How high would you rate? And I need you to level with me here. I don't need you to say, I'm doing great. The Lord is my shepherd. Can we drop that? The last couple of weeks, I've had some great exchanges with a number of you. People who've honestly shared, my marriage is not going well. 
I've come to church more from tradition, but not giving a full yes to God in full trust. I've not helped the unity of our church. I had a young man that came to me last week and he said, you know, the last couple of weeks that I've been hearing the word of God preached, it's made me so hungry for the Bible. And so I've just been reading and reading and he was so excited about the things that God is doing in his heart. And so we prayed right then and there that God would seal what he's doing in his life. But that's how God moves us toward joy. It begins with God's yes to us in Christ. And with our realization that on the night of his arrest, while Jesus was sweating drops of blood because of the anguish of his heart, and he was begging God to take away the cup, the cup of suffering that was coming his way, his father said no. God said no to his beloved son. God said no to the king of kings so that through him, he might say yes to us for all eternity. And when the extent of that love punctures our hearts, we begin to see by the Spirit of God how much we've been complicit in destructive dynamics in our relationships that don't lead to joy, that don't lead to love, that don't lead to unity or holiness. And that's where repentance is born and change and spiritual breakthrough take place. That's gloriously what happened to the Corinthians, as we're going to see in chapter 7. And from that place of repentance, God bringing you low, you will leap with shouts of joy. Weeping may stay for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And you'll be able to say to God, I trust you, Father, that you will turn my mourning to dancing. Can we just pause for a second and praise our God? If you've seen him turn your mourning to dancing, can we praise him? Can we let it swell? Yes, if you have seen him again and again turn your mourning to dancing, praise him. And maybe right now you are in a time of mourning. But if you've walked with God for any length of time, you know, you know that joy, joy comes in the morning. I promise you, if you find yourself dragging in your Christian walk, you feel like you're trying to move forward, but it's like walking under water. Take your eyes away from people, away from circumstances, and lift them up to God's yes in Christ and to his spirit in your heart, and you will find joy. The sovereign Lord shall be your strength. He will make your feet like the feet of a deer. He will enable you to tread on the heights. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, O oh God, that we have you. That we have you as our Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. It's so hard for us to see you that way. We have harsh thoughts of you, God. We see you as distant, unconcerned, aloof. But that's not you, Lord. That is sin keeping us from seeing you as you are. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for his love for us. I thank you for all that he has done. I thank you that he is your yes. That it's always yes in Christ. And I pray, Father, for those who may be here who have never known your love. They've never known your forgiveness. I pray that you would bring them near. I pray that they would enjoy your comfort. That they would be able to see the truth of Christ, his beauty, his greatness. And I pray they'd be able to respond to you, humble themselves before you, acknowledge that they cannot make their life prosperous, good, perfect. 
that on our own, we tend to ruin things, to make them harder, to get into a mess, that relationally, we cannot have prosperous relationships, flourishing relationships, because we are fickle and we easily get hurt and begin to, tr to treat others from a place of hurt and distrust. I pray, Father, that you would forgive us for all the ways in which we have helped to strain relationships, not to heal them. All the ways that we have not been peacemakers over the last two years, God, but the ways that we have fought, the ways that we have brought turmoil into our homes with our spouses, the ways that we have failed to approach them with forgiveness, with the hope of Christ, with tenderness, just as you're tender toward us. I pray that you would convict us of that and bring repentance. I pray for our relationship with our children. When we as parents have abused our authority or when we have been hurt by them and begun to avoid them, resent them, attack them, dread them, I pray, Father, that you would bring us to know your yes in Christ and that we would know that our children need that yes just as desperately and that they need your compassion as much as we need your compassion. I pray for children who have maybe been defiant to their parents and that is just the way they relate to them. And I pray, dear God, that you would bring softness to their hearts as they come to see how tender you are toward them in the Savior. And so I pray that healing would come into our homes. I pray, Father, that if we have not been peacemakers in our workplaces and we've had difficult co-workers and we have maybe even been smug or looked down on them or, or, or been self-righteous or thinking they are so off, they are so lost. Father, I pray that you would help us know that we're working for you, that you're bringing us into the places that you bring us to so that we may bring truth, but also so we may bring grace. So we may extend the love of Christ to any and all. Father, in any other relationship, maybe even in the church family, where we've not contributed to unity, but to disunity. Where maybe we have stayed back rather than giving our all, just as Christ gave his all, even though it cost him his life. I pray, Father that you would help us trust you and that we would know that you, yes, you turn graves into gardens. You turn our shame into glory. Turn our mourning to dancing. And I pray, oh God, that as we go into this next chapter of our life as the body of Christ, that we would place praying together at the center, that we would know that when we, your people, get together, we pray. We pray before you. Because in prayer, oh God, you heal us, you move, you hear us, and you do things that only you can do, God. We love you. We worship you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, I think it's only fitting that we end with a song. I thought Pastor John was going to start singing in the middle of his message there. But we're gonna, we got to sing that song together this morning, all right? So let's stand together and let's close our time together by, by lifting up this last song, all right? Graves into Gardens. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Are never enough. And then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's no
Seas in the heart 